Look in detail at how Beijing uses its national security laws on the mainland. You, you don't really understand the real situation in Hong Kong. I ask you to come back to the situation in Hong Kong, how one country, two systems really operate. Hong Kong never leaves the news for long these days. Now it's the draft of a new security law to be imposed by Beijing that's provoking controversy and protest. Joining me this week from Hong Kong is Regina Ip, a member of the city's Legislative Council and chair of the pro-Beijing New People's Party. Will the communist authorities try to use this law, as they have with other security statutes on the mainland, to violate basic rights and restrict free expression? Regina Ip. Welcome to Conflict Zone. Hello. You recently wrote an article about the controversial new security law that China is going to impose on Hong Kong, and you said this does not necessarily spell the death of Hong Kong's separate systems. But you're taking a huge gamble backing this law, aren't you? Because Beijing has done everything it can to prove that it's not interested in those separate systems, not interested in freedom of expression, human rights, or the rule of law, is it? Um, I don't think you need to jump to a conclusion, because China already has its own national security law, you know, which is only a few pages long, which consists mainly of principles, exhortations, duties, obligations. Um, I think the fact that it needs, it feels obliged to enact a Hong Kong version reflects its understanding that Hong Kong needs a version which is consistent with our common law system. That's why Beijing is going ahead to enact a special Hong Kong-specific national security law for us. But, Regina, if you say don't jump to conclusions, let's look at China's record. Mass surveillance on hundreds of thousands of people from CCTV cameras, up to a million Uyghurs locked up in Xinjiang region, many without charge or trial, booksellers from Hong Kong disappeared. Doubtless all of them dealt with under the same kind of security laws that are coming to Hong Kong, aren't they? And none of that, you say, necessarily spells the death of Hong Kong's separate system. Of course it does. Well, you are talking about mainland China. You are not talking about Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, you know, we have the common law system. And we have the presumption of innocence. Anyone arrested can apply for habeas corpus. Conviction on criminal offense needs very high burden of proof. In fact, proving beyond reasonable doubt. All these safeguards are here. Moreover, we already implemented the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights through our basic law and the Bill of Rights in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong has a different system. You shouldn't lump our system together with mainland China's system. We have strong protection of personal data privacy. So what you just said simply does not apply to Hong Kong. Well, you say you have these common law safeguards. How long are you going to have them for when the new law comes into, into effect? Look in detail at how Beijing uses its national security laws on the mainland to curtail personal freedoms and snuff out dissident voices. That's, that's what is in store well, for Hong the, Kong, isn't it? You, you don't really understand the real situation in Hong Kong. Our law enforcement agencies, our prosecution lawyers, our judges are all trained in the common law system. If Beijing introduces a version, uh, in, including offenses which are wide open, not sufficiently clearly defined, our people won't be able to implement it and our judges won't be able to adjudicate on those offenses. So that's why I think Beijing is taking advice from Hong Kong, especially the common law lawyers, as to how to delineate the specific offenses they have in mind. Why, why should we accept that China is going to adopt this benign attitude that you describe towards Hong Kong when its own justice system on the mainland, according to Amnesty International, remains plagued by unfair trials, torture and other ill treatment in detention? Why do you think you'll be able to carry on with the same common law safeguards? that you have at the moment. You can't truthfully make that assertion because Beijing hasn't said it will, has it? 
Well, again, you are ignoring the fact that uh, Beijing has respected our common law system, and we have carried on with our common law system for 23 years since the reunification. You know, the stability and the predictability of the common law system is here for everybody to see. What you keep kept describing is a situation in in mainland China, according to certain human rights organization. Uh, they do this sort of description does not apply to Hong Kong. I must ask you how to do you look know squarely how at do the you real know that? situation in Hong Kong. How do you know that it doesn't well, apply do to mean, Hong how Kong? How do I know that? I know. I how? know how? because Where's, our where common has law Beijing system has that? been working. Where has Beijing said you know the, the our law, methods will not in apply in Hong law, Kong? In the basic law. In the basic law, it says that all legal systems previously enforced will continue to apply, at least up to 2047. Yeah. Really, in the last couple of our days, our common law system is highly regarded. In the last couple of days, rated. in the our, last our couple legal, of days, let me finish. You are interviewing me. You should let me finish. Give me a chance to finish my answer. Please yeah. go ahead. The World Justice Project, the World Justice Project rates our legal system number 16 worldwide, three places higher than that of the American system. You should respect that. Yes, and for how long will it remain that way? For at least until 2047. And our courts at the highest level, our courts at the highest level have non-permanent judges, highly respected jurists from Commonwealth jurisdictions. These are not people who can be pushed around. They will adjudicate cases according to common law jurisprudence. In the last couple of days, you've made clear that not only will Beijing's security law be imposed, but at the same time, a major pillar of the justice system is also to be got rid of jury trials for those indicted under this new legislation. You say juries might not be appropriate. I think that was the term you used. Not appropriate. Why? Because they might not deliver the verdict that you politicians want to see. Uh, that's, uh, I said nothing that would undermine our existing system. Jury trial is only appropriate for offences tried in our high court. If the offences attract sentences below seven years imprisonment, they can go to lower courts. That's a fact. As to where the courts, were, as to where the offences should be tried, our court of final appeal has held that it should be a dis decision for our prosecution people. Of course, nowadays, with so much online bullying going on, you know, so much doxing, you know, it is a, a fact that some jurors might be so intimidated as to, uh, as to become worried about serving as jurors in these cases. That is a fact, a reality that I wish to point out. And why shouldn't judges be intimidated either, who in future judges who might be told in advance what the verdict is, just like the system on the mainland. That's how it's going to be, isn't it, in Hong Kong? Well, I can tell you, as legislators, I am being intimidated too, because uh, there are people urging the US and the UK to put me on sanctions list. Is that fair? What do you say to that? People threatening my freedoms and rights. Regina, it, Beijing's draft law already suggests that the independence of judges will come under direct threat, doesn't it? Article 3 of the draft decision says Hong Kong's legislative and judicial organs must, in accordance with relevant laws, effectively prevent, stop and punish acts endangering national security. That's telling the judges how to do their job, isn't it? So much for the independence of the judiciary being safeguarded. Uh, being independent, being an independent branch of the, the government doesn't mean that they, are not, they are, have not sworn loyalty to the uh, basic law or allegiance to the country. All judges on taking up their office, they have sworn allegiance to the country. They have a duty to protect the welfare of Hong Kong being a part of the nation. I see nothing wrong with that. I won't equate that with threatening the independence of our judiciary. You, you hold up a copy of the basic law, but the Hong Kong Bar Association, which knows a thing or two about law, has what it calls fundamental constitutional and legal concerns about this new law. They point out that Article 23, agreed by joint declaration, says Hong Kong shall enact laws on its own to prohibit treason, secession, subversion. 
But having a law imposed, security law imposed by Beijing, is not enacting laws on its own, is it? Well, you made a good point. Then why did the Bar Association did not support the draft national security legislation I championed back in 2002? I tried very hard to help Hong Kong to enact national security laws on our own. Why did they object to that? And in the course of the public scrutiny, I gave them many concessions. Now, the Article 23 imposes a constitutional duty on us to prohibit certain national security offenses, but it does not preclude the, the PRC authorities from acting under their constitution. The problem with our Bar Association is that it ignores the laws of China. It only focuses on the basic law of Hong Kong, uh, which, is merely, which sets out the constitutional arrangements for Hong Kong. But the um, National People's Congress is the highest authority in mainland China, and the Bar Association has persisted and in persisted in ignoring these realities. So the National People's Congress can just sweep aside the basic laws. It feels like the Bar Association says it would appear that the National People's Congress has no power to add the national security law that it's proposing under Article 23. The NPC has not swept away the powers of uh, or under the basic law, the decision the decision of the NPC, the seven-point decision, in two of the points, they urged the Hong Kong government to get on with enacting legislation locally on our own to fulfill our constitutional obligations. You know, Our duty under Article 23 does not preclude Beijing authorities from doing their own thing to protect national security. Certainly, every country has a right to protect its security and territorial integrity. Let's look at what happened uh, back in 2003 when you were security minister and you tried and failed to push through a security law against subversion and treason for Hong Kong. It brought the people out in their hundreds of thousands against it and you had to resign your post. Because why? Because people didn't trust this law and they didn't trust the provisions of it. And they still don't, do they? They still don't. Well, well Hong Kong has undergone many crises of confidence in the past hundred years, you know. But our systems have remained robust, you know. And um, a lot of people are now regretting they should have supported the version that I championed 17 years ago. Um, moreover, a lot of people came out to protest, not just because of the national security law, but because of the SARS epidemic at that time and many economic problems. And the difference between then and now is that at that time, after then chief executive announced he would um, not go ahead with the legislation, people went home peacefully. But in the past year, we have seen a lot of violence, a lot of subversive activity, a lot of... Uh, terrorist activities, uh, and a lot of, of legitimate protests. Extremely dangerous, uh, as in the U.S., as in the U.S. We're you know, talking we about, we're talking about protests, Hong Kong. But we have also had, we, are, we also have a lot of smashing of windows, beating up innocent bystanders, hoarding of explosives, uh, ransacking of the Legislative Council. And a lot of police brutality bombs. as These well. are unprecedented. And a lot of police brutality uh, as well, Regina. You are joking. Not a single citizen has been mortally wounded by our police force. On the other hand, in the past week, three police officers have died of exhaustion after off-duty. We are totally unlike the U.S., where the policemen kill at least 1,000 people every year. You must be fair. There are no such thing as police brutality in Hong Kong. Well, let, let's not bring in the U.S. here. You have to show me a single... You, we are not talking about the U.S., but give me one specific instance of police brutality. You cannot just take the words of the likes of Joshua Wong for granted. What about setting people on fire? That yeah, was we, one we, of the we, protests. We saw, that we saw, what about we saw hitting on video. A, a cleaner with break? You say that it'll give you a single example. We saw on video a few months ago a policeman shooting a demonstrator, an unarmed demonstrator, directly in the stomach. You must have seen it as well. Wasn't that police brutality, Regina Ip? 
That's not police brutality. The policeman was trying to protect himself. The from an unarmed was charging man. at him. From an These, unarmed man. Well, an unarmed man can also be dangerous. The, the, there have been several shooting incidents in the past 12 months. Each incident has been carefully examined by the police, and they have basically been exculpated by the expert groups uh, engaged by our independent police complaints council. You say that. The Bar Association raises the issue of how this new law is going to be enforced by China. The draft decision says that, when needed, relevant national security organs of the Central People's Government will set up agencies in Hong Kong to safeguard national security in accordance with the new law. What are we talking about here, Regina Ip? Beijing's secret police I don't think, operating... I don't think are we they talking are. about Beijing's secret police operating in Hong Kong as and when they want? Um, I don't think they're talking about direct enforcement of law. Enforcement of laws will continue to be the responsibility of our policemen. That's not know. what it says. Uh, it is against the basic law. No, 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 that's what, what you described. They did not say what you described. They only said that some national security agency may be set up on a need basis, as in Macau. Macau has a National Security Council. Yeah, but we what, what does that mean? I'm asking Security you Council. what that means. Does it mm. mean that Beijing secret... We, we wait, exactly, we you don't wait know. for the details. So you can't give we any comfortable know. assertions. And you should not... You can't give any comforting but, and assertions you cannot, about this. And you cannot give any unwarranted accusations. Hmm? If there are no facts... You are making unwarranted accusations. Will these agencies operate under mainland law or Hong Kong law? You don't know, do you? No, no, no. It's in the basic law. They must obey Hong Kong law. What I said is, it is not clear yet what any new national security agency would be responsible for. It could simply be responsible for public education, publicity and promotion, you know. You cannot jump to the conclusion that they are they will be enforcing Hong Kong law. That's what they bring, that's what they do when they bring in their national security organs of the central police government, is it? If central people's government. That's what they are looking for. Education, is it? You don't know that. Uh, again, you are uh, you and you have no, no factual basis for making those sort of statements. You are simply making a lot of sweeping allegations based on your own assumptions and bias. Well, there's no assumptions and bias when you look at how the national security organs of the Central People's Government operate when they're in, on the mainland. Um, we are not talking about mainland. We are talking about one country, two systems. Let's come back to Hong Kong. It doesn't look as though it's one country, two systems if they're bringing in their enforced. national security organs have and imposing their security laws on Hong Kong. It doesn't look like two systems. It looks like one country, one system, if you do that. They are enacting, they are trying to enact a Hong Kong-specific version, which is consistent with our common law systems. If they just wish to implement, impose China's system on us, they could just apply this to us, China's national security law, but they are not doing this. They are now consulting Hong Kong experts about an, uh, um, drafting a Hong Kong-specific version for us to take account of our separate systems. One of the things you said recently in your article was that Beijing has a tacit understanding that the new law needs to be drafted in a way that's consistent with common law norms and strikes a balance between protecting national security and upholding personal rights and freedoms. First point, Regina, if tacit understandings are by definition meaningless, aren't they? Well, tacit understanding, you know, is reflected by the fact that they are not imposing the national law on Hong Kong. They are drafting a Hong Kong-specific law. In fact, because they understand our system is different, in the basic law, they ask us to do it on our own. But because we failed to do so in the past 23 years, so Beijing authorities have no option but to get on with introducing a set of laws that will protect national security and discourage separatist activities. That's what they are doing. They are not imposing national laws on Hong Kong. Tell me they why. know our system is different. Tell, the, the offenses that they are worried about, for example, secession, uh, subversion, under the common law, these offenses need to be very clearly spelled out, and they will need expert help from Hong Kong.
Perhaps your assurances would carry more weight if uh, what we'd been seeing in Hong Kong hadn't been taking place, and that's the erosion of existing rights, isn't it? Last month, UN human rights experts severely criticized police for the arrest of peaceful demonstrations in violation, they said, of norms, international norms and rights. They demanded that the Hong Kong government immediately drop the criminal prosecution of 15 pro-democracy activists who took part in peaceful protests last year. If you're so concerned about the rule of law in Hong Kong, um, why are you not going to release these people? I think you have been talking to the wrong people and take, listening only to one-sided opinions. Take, for example, June 4th commemorations continue to take place in Hong Kong, even though, though the participants violated our public, hall, public health laws prohibiting group, um, group gatherings. The police allowed them to gather in Victoria Park and facilitated the gathering. No difference. I don't think there will be any difference after the national Hong Kong version of the national security law has been enacted. Peaceful gatherings, peaceful processions will continue to be allowed. The police tried to ban that uh, vigil, as you know, in Victoria Park, didn't they? Well, the police did not try, did not ban that. The police facilitated at least 10,000 uh, public meetings and processions. The police have been banning, uh, not giving approval in recent months because of the COVID-19 situation, because we have enacted public health laws prohibiting group gatherings of more than eight people. You've had only five we locally... We have not issued stayed-at-home orders. You have, you have only five locally transmitted infections, five in the week of June the 1st, after more than two weeks with no local cases, taking the total number of infections to just over 1,004 deaths. Pro-democracy campaigners said it was just an excuse to try and block an unwelcome event. And they were right, weren't they? Thank you for pointing out that we have done well in fighting COVID-19, but we should not take anything for granted. We should not sacrifice public safety, you know, uh, just to accommodate uh, these uh, protest requests. They can do it after the, the COVID-19 is completely under control. Moreover, we have detected two local outbreaks recently in public housing estates, the sources of which have not yet been traced. Beijing's declared reason for this new law, Regina Ip, is to maintain order in Hong Kong and to counteract what it calls characteristics of terrorism and separation. But that's not the real worry, is it? The fact is this security law reflects Beijing's paranoia about free speech and freedom in general, doesn't it? That's a very unfair statement. In the past 12 months, the police have uncovered at least two, two cases of extremely dangerous TATP explosive hoarded in Chinwan in the school, and lots of weaponry. Dangerous weapons have been used in a lot of so-called peaceful protests, you know, and innocent people have been killed. These violent events have never occurred in Hong Kong, and there are people waving, promoting Hong Kong independence, you know, waving Hong Kong flags, you know, chanting revolutionary songs, you know, these are activities that no government would allow. A lot of Hong Kong people are very angry about it. Chanting revolutionary to songs. to return to law and order. Chanting yes, revolutionary yes, songs. Yes, definitely. You're perfectly definitely. entitled to chant revolutionary songs in free countries, Regina Ip. You can go to London or Washington and chant whatever revolutionary songs you want. Why don't you try it? Um, uh, it depends on whether the songs are chanted as in uh, an opera, Les Miserables, or chanted as a part of a well-organized and well-planned action plan to stoke separatist sentiments. You know. At the end of the day, your, your reason, your pitch to the people of Hong Kong is Trust Beijing. This security law will not be used in the same way that Beijing uses its security laws to tamp down on freedoms on the mainland. This is what you're asking them, to accept that China is not going to behave the way it behaves on the mainland in Hong Kong. Do you really believe that? Of course. Trust our motherland. 
Our motherland has nothing but good intentions for the people of Hong Kong and also trust the basic law, trust one country, two systems, which has worked well in the past 23 years, you know. Why doesn't you it know? have better country, intentions towards its own people on the mainland? Why is it uh, torturing them in prisons and locking up a million Uyghurs in re so-called re-education camps? Why is it doing that? I must ask you to... I must ask you not to confuse and fuse the issues, but keep talking about making allegations about the mainland, which have nothing to do with one country, two systems. I ask you to come back to the situation in Hong Kong, how one country, two systems really operate, and don't allow your bias hmm, to color your, your, your uh, reports on Hong Kong. That's totally unfair to Hong Kong people. I take strong objection to that. Regina Ip, it's been good to have you on Conflict Zone. Thank you very much.